Good morning. Good morning. Uh, um, you know, before we jump into teaching, I want to kind of talk a little bit about the last couple teachings. If you've noticed, there's two unique things that we've talked about the last two teachings. The first was Mary and how she went to Jesus' feet and washed Jesus' feet with her perfume and her hair. And then we're in the Lord's Supper we talked about last week, and we see Jesus going around and washing people's feet as well. And what we've been talking a lot during this time is this place that we have this relationship with God and loving Him, and it's both vertical and it's both horizontal. And before we get into teaching, I just want to kind of remind us to keep applying, putting into practice the things that have come out of those two teachings. Because what that's talking about is our worship is that way, and it's both giving and receiving. To receive, it requires you to go to God in humility and trust and welcome Him, right? And so we've been talking a lot about the place of be people who are receiving, but also as we're receiving, we can give to God. Just like we talked about, we can pour out our lives like we just sang, and we can worship Him directly and in our times with God. And so we're just encouraging you, be receiving and giving this way, but also understand the way God actually interacts with us is also by people coming to us, brothers and sisters in Christ coming to us and loving us. And that through that, God, we receive from God, and that takes humility and trust. But we also are people, like they, we talked about last week, are to call to serve one another. And so I say that because we're in this strange time in which that we're, especially in this vertical, uh, excuse me, in this horizontal place of our relationship with one another, it's like a little harder to get together. It's a little harder to do this. It's, it's, and what I would say is, I just want to strongly encourage you to understand that is essential. In fact, in Hebrews it says, let's not neglect, ne neglect the meeting together, which is the habit of some, which is like, well, we're trying. It's not easy, right? But the thing is, is how do we do that? It said, and so, but consider how to stir one another up to love and good deeds. In other words, the idea of that is like, get creative, right? Think about ways that you can love one another. And so I just want to remind us of seven words that we typically say. Now, what are the seven words? That's right. And we'll give you seven more. All right. So we have two seven words we want you to say a lot. We want you to be able to just, we are a people, our church is known for praying for each other. And we need to have that increase. And so we, I just want you to encourage you to be saying these things. Can I pray for you right now? And I also want you to be saying, would you pray for me? Will you pray for me right now? And because both of those are essential, I think. And I, and I say that because if you think about our church, maybe we have uh, maybe 250, 300 people who say, this is my church. So just imagine half of those people spread all around, thinking every day, going to God and saying, God, show me what to do, and, and paying attention to this nudge that they get and putting it into practice, you know? And it can be just a simple text, a call, Maybe it's a gift, it was a, a car, it can be lots of things. It can be a connection on the, on the deck or whatever the things are that you want to do. But the thing is, be intentional and then let's start really, I encourage you to start putting this into practice, right? This is how, this is a, this is a place in which that we want the church to continue to connect to one another, but it takes creativity. So, so anyway, so I encourage you to do that. Um, now we're going to apply the next one a little bit later here, but we're going to talking about this place of Jesus living in expectation. And it's really a conversation after Lord's Supper, probably could have even been during that time, but it's right in that place in which Jesus knows that his hour has come and he's preparing his disciples for what's ahead. And the world is extremely uncertain and he's saying, this is how you live in expectation during this time. This is how you live in this way. And so we're going we're to be talking about that. So let's go ahead and start out with this place of just um, praying. Uh, we're also going to be... Uh, uh, the offering, if you are committed to our church, you can go to our offering page and uh, all the instructions are there. We're going to pray for the offering, but let's just pray for our time. So take a few breaths, close your eyes, Holy Spirit. We just welcome you into our time right now. Just tell them something you're grateful for and thank you for that right now what comes to your mind, and just tell him what you're grateful for. Thank you, God.
He loves us to come to him where we're at. Maybe your heart's a little dull or you've had a rough week and you've done some things you regret. There. But his grace is there. He says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us of anything that is unrighteous. And he does that as a gift to us. And all we do is ask him to do that. God, take us back to understanding our position with you right now. Just open up anything this week that is clouding your heart or dulling your heart. Holy Spirit, just come. And just ask God to give you a receptive heart to be able to be present during this teaching, whether you're online or you're here. God, give us your grace. Help us to be able to be seeking you during this time and listening. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see things that we couldn't see otherwise. And we ask you to do that. Ask you to do that for the kids as well, or as they learn about you, that they'll experience you, that your eyes will be open to truth. Lord, as we take this offering, we thank you for how good you are to us. And we just trust you and we love you. Use it to advance the things that are eternal, the things that matter. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Let's, let's go with a question here. What are you expecting for the rest of the day? And to make it even a bigger question, what are you expecting for this week? This month? Keeps going, doesn't it? This year? This next year? You know, what do you, what do you expect? A lot. Expectations is a is an interesting thing because it's this thing it's, it's something we're, it, we believe is going to happen it's probable or sometimes we think it's certainly going to happen and uh, it's this place and when we're talking about expectations we're going to primarily talk in the place of you know, obviously you can expect bad things but we're going to talk mainly in the positive the space of anticipation for good and so are the things that we're counting on but in quite honestly we have so many expectations so many we don't even know about <laughs> We are humans, and humans live with expectations. They assume things are going to take place. Those are expectations. And they're hoping those things will be good. As we think about that, as if you go through life, you understand that uh, there are lots of expectations, and when those are fulfilled, it's great. And when they're not fulfilled, it's kind of hard. You know, I, looked at, I did a research. I thought, well, I should, I should research this a little bit so I look smarter. And... Uh, and the research was interesting because the research was, you know what it was all about? How to protect yourself from wrong expectations. I couldn't find hardly anything positive. It was like, you know, and in fact, I looked at this one, in a, this one 12-step group. Their, their motto is, which I completely understand, is expectations are premeditated resentments. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, whoa, that's a... Uh, and then I, I uh, began looking at Psychology Today articles and they begin listing all the things that cause the disappointment of expectations. Magical thinking is one of them. Like, you believe that if you think it like a kid does, a kid thinks that they think something, it will actually come true. Some Americans think that too, after they're older, right? They begin thinking, they kind of create a world in their expectations and constantly are falling because they're living in, in magical thinking. But then sometimes expectations are just normal stuff of life, right? Here's kind of how you know you have expectations. This is what comes out of you when the expectation isn't met. Really? You gotta be kidding me. No, 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 no. You know, those kind of things like, oh, those things. Usually the oh describes an expectation that's not being met. You know, you, you come home from the drive through with your family and you look at the bag and there's missing two hamburgers with a crying kid. And you go, really? Right? Or, or you get to a spot where you're, uh, you know, you have excited for this thing that's going to happen, and you get there, and the person completely forgot about doing it. <laughs> or gets canceled or rained out. You know, you get to this place in which that you, you, you're a little bit late, but you're going to get home in time, and you hit a detour, and you said, really? You know? It's all these things that happen in this world that's very difficult. You know, there's this place that, or you're, in the bigger picture, your life goes a different way than you expect. Wow, I wasn't expecting that. Those are the bigger things. Or you have somebody who promised to be faithful to you and was not, and we could go on. And you start understanding how 
they can come up with these particular things of, you know, expectations or premeditated resentments, or at least discouragement sometimes. But there's this thing about it is that, you know, and it, Proverbs talks about hope defer makes the heart grow sick. Uh, but, you know, the thing about that is, but, but longing fulfilled is a tree of life, you know. But the tree of life thing just keeps us going because we love this feeling of when expectations take place. And we can't keep ourselves from doing it. You know, there's even, this has been going on for centuries. Back in the 1600s, there's this is Pope Alexander, Alexander, uh, excuse me, he was a Pope, but he's a poet. His name was Alexander, Alexander uh, Pope, and he has this uh, phrase uh, that he, in his poetry. Blessed are those who expect nothing, for he shall receive nothing and never be disappointed. <laughs> And we can start doing that. We can say, I'm just going to lower the expectations. But quite honestly, we can't. You and I are made to expect good. We're designed by God to do that. And so no matter what we do, we find ourselves in this place of desiring good to take place. It's this thing the Bible calls hope. And it's built into us. And this thing of living in expectation and uh, uh, expectation, anticipation, it's really a good thing. I mean, it has this powerful effect on how we live. You know, uh, think about things, even in just a natural form, in which something good is coming, and how powerful that is to you presently. Sometimes Debbie's a really good cook, and my wife Debbie, and she'll go, I get ready to leave, she'll go, oh, don't be, be home at 6.30, we're, we're making this. Like, ooh, I like that, right? All day, my day is better because I can think at 6.30, this thing is coming. I've been mowing the yard in 100 degree weather and I think, how do I get through this? At the end of my mowing experience, I'm totally soaked and I plop down in this chair in the shade and I bring a big glass of water and I listen to music and I sit there and just stare for a while and that makes my yard work so much better. Knowing that's coming, right? It can be the same thing on a college degree, and many other things in which we have. I just recently, uh, we're, right after this service, we're heading out to Michigan because a pastor uh, gave us his vacation home in Holland, Michigan. Guess what? My week went better this week. I got a lot done because I have this thing that's coming, right? I'm excited, more excited now than ever because I'm leaving. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry but, but the reality of it is, is that, that that's expectation. It has this effect on you, on how you live, and how you do things. And so as you look at that is that the thing about Jesus, he lived in the same world where things didn't go great, right? Yeah, it, 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 uh, it was a rough world. He bumped against things that shouldn't have happened, right? But when we see Jesus, even right now, even in a place in which that he has Judas betraying him, people wanting to, plotting and killing him, Peter going to deny him, and all that's coming, we find Jesus actually living in expectation right now. <laughs> and, and to me, that's just, just wild. And so when Jesus is talking, I, I think the thing about it is the disciples, though, were not probably doing too well right about now. The disciples had, you know, they were just reeling because all this stuff was going on. They probably knew Jeremiah. They quoted, they probably in their mind probably thought of Jeremiah where Jesus, where God says to them, I know the plans I have you, for you, declares the Lord, plans that will prosper you and not harm you, plans that will give you a hope and a future. They probably knew that in their head, but they weren't feeling it in their heart. They were not doing well. And so the disciples were in a spot where they were undone, and Jesus is speaking to them and helping them to start experiencing expectancy and hope for the future, and that's what we're going to be talking about. So if you want to turn over there, then we're continuing to talking to the disciples. This is really the same conversation we can just kind of pick up, continues on. As 24 hours from now, Jesus will be on the cross, and so he knows every word he says is super important. And so he's talking to Simon, and Simon, Peter, asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, 
Why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Now, this had to be pretty wild for Peter. <laughs> Peter is already trying to process Jesus washing his feet, right? He's, he's trying to figure out what's going on with Judas. He's, it's, it's, it's just a very wild environment. And so he's in a place, now Jesus has been speaking publicly and talking about going away. And, and we look back in John 13, he says it again. It says, you know, you'll only be with you a little bit longer. You know, I'm going someplace and you cannot come. And so the Jesus, it, so Peter's following up on that. And he says to him again, where I am going, you cannot follow me. But this time he adds more information than he ever has before. He says, but you will follow later. And Peter, just, you know, being Peter, Peter is the guy who it's a ready, fire, aim. You know, that's, that's his, his approach to life. And so he says whatever comes out of his mouth very quickly, and which is very encouraging to me because he's like the top guy and he says the most raw things, which I think it means prayer should be really raw. We can say anything to God. We can tell him anything we're thinking. We can ask him any questions. And there's much that comes out in Scripture because he just asks him these things. And so when Peter responds to him and these questions, he basically says, wait a second, I do want to go with you. Now, this is kind of a brave heart moment. He catches on, he's going to die. And so what Peter's thinking is, I will die with you. You know, let's do this together. He goes, well, my death's not a normal death. It's something that you won't even be able to even enter into. In fact, you won't just retreat. You'll deny you even known me. Not just one time, but three times. Now, if you can imagine how Peter was doing after, this, after he said this and what he must have been rattled in. But what's really important here, we're going to move into chapter 14. And this is where the chapters, we, we understand they're put in there by man because this is a continued conversation. <laughs> and stopping here is not the end of the story. You will deny me three times and we stop. He says that, and then right after that, he says this, starting in chapter 14, verse 1. He says, now he's speaking to Peter and probably to the other disciples as well. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. These three verses are not just for Peter, even though that's where it's directed. It's not just for the larger disciples. It's for anyone who has a relationship with Jesus. And these three verses can bring amazing an ability to live in a place of expectation, if we can just take them in. And so when we're thinking about this, imagine Jesus saying this to you. Put yourself in that position where you're undone, life you can't figure out the plan, you don't know what's going on, and he speaks this to you. You know, the thing is, is, is it's, it, they were troubled, right? He says, that, let your heart be troubled. The word trouble in Greek is just this place, it's agitation. Do you know agitation when things aren't going well? When you don't know your future? When, you, when things are hard, you just get irritable? It's this place, it's actually just to stir up. You know, troubled waters, it's a stirring up, but it's actually tied to the motion. It's to set in motion something that should be still, is what that means. And so Jesus is saying, you're all stirred up. I want you to, get, I want you to become still in this. And what he does, he tells them, in these next lines, he tells you, this is how you can be settled and not be stirred up. And he goes on and he talks about this house. His father's house, some translations say it's a mansion. It has many rooms. The whole concept here, it's lots of space for you. It's, and, there's, and then he goes on to say, and by the way, you're going to come 
And I'm going to have, I'm already, I'm preparing a unique place just because I know you and I know who you are. I mean, this is, this is interesting because in this, he's using really this language of home and family and belonging and all the things that are so crucial to what they need. I mean, it's not just, you know, it's not some institutional thing. It's not a cloud we're sitting on. It is a home. He's describing to get a hold of what's happening here. This, the, this place in the future, this place of heaven, it actually is very relational. And it's a place that we dwell and abide together. And so as he's talking about this, I love, one of my favorite parts of this is in verse 2. It's one of my favorite things. In the middle of this, he kind of puts this in. He says, if it were not so, would I have told you? Why do you say that? I think if you study the Greek and figure it out, it's because they thought maybe this isn't so. <laughs> and when you, when you listen to this, it's like, it's like a kid going, nah. Why? Because it's too good. <laughs> it's, it's like, Really? It's, I mean, Jesus is saying this. So, so an interpretation would be this is, I'm Jesus. <laughs> I'm God in the flesh. And I'm telling you this. I don't tell you this unless it's true. Because he wants us to take this in, not as some kind of mystical thing. He wants to take it in as a reality that we live with, right? And so in that spot, he... he as he talks about this, they, they take that in. And then the question is, okay, there's this home. How do we get there? And Jesus answers in verse 4. He says, you know, Jesus, he says, you know, how, how are you going to get there, right? And he says, well, you know the way to the place I'm going. And, of course, we'll see this even further next week. But this place of understanding that Jesus actually is the way. That he says, that's why he goes back to this place. You already believe in God, now just believe in me. If you do that, you'll get there. I am the way to that. Understand, if you keep listening to me, you will be there. And so in that spot, if he understands that. Now, what he's doing here, he's helping them begin, right now they're in the middle of everything, he's helping them get an eternal perspective. I don't know about you, but eternity is a little bit outside my bandwidth of my brain. You guys ever think about eternity very much? It's like... It, it just kind of fries after a certain point. I, got, I get to the point I just got to stop because I can't even think it that way. But I would say this. It's a long time, right? Uh, one illustration I saw, I think Francis Chow did this some, somewhat like this, but as I thought about this, I kind of used that, so I thought, got a little geekier, and I thought of something extremely long that we could visualize, all right? And so I'm sure you've all studied up on this, but uh, uh, living your life's eternal specter, it, it, to think of it like a long cable, because I'm a guy and I use cables. All right, so cable. Okay, we're going to talk about the CME We 3 cable. How many know the CME 3 We cable? Some of you know that. Okay, this is good. This is uh, it's surprising. So the CME 3, We 3 cable, it means the uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Middle East, and Western Europe. This cable was completed in 2000. 24,000 miles long, and it covers 33, goes over 33 countries into four continents. One cable. I can't even get my extension cords from not breaking, so I'm not sure how they do this, but they have this cable. And as you think about that, that to just to put that, just wrap a cable around the earth, that's about what you got. That's just, that's just part of eternity. Now, the thing about this is, is that eternity has started now, right? We are, we are eternal beings, right? And we, according to all statistics, if you average them together, you got 72 years. If you, if you make it past that, you're doing good, right? Okay, 72 years is the average. And so imagine that cable that's wrapping around the earth. As you think about that, here's your 72 years right there. That's it. That's the 72 years. What that does, it shows you a perspective of eternity. And what it means is, when you look at that yellow, that yellow tape or whatever that thing is I put on there, uh, that if you look at that and you think of that 72 years, what you realize is a couple things. It goes really quick, 
and it's really important because it affects the rest, right? That is what happens with an eternal perspective. And the thing about this is, is that the way that you see eternity will change the way you live now dramatically. The more you grasp eternity, the more you see 72 years in a whole different light. And so your unseen future can change your present. You understand what I mean by that? The unseen future that you grasp a hold of will change the way you live right now. It, it will affect it dramatically. In fact, we see that in Hebrews where it talks about this place of faith, which is trusting in and, 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 and what Jesus and what, what Scripture says, what God says. It says, now faith is confident in what is hoped, what we hope for, and the assurance about what we do not see. Look at that again. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we do not see. Now the thing of hope, we see it as very light. It's, it's, it's the substance. It's something we know to be true. It's something that we expect and lean on and live by. And what that means is it's a substance. So this thing of the future that Jesus is pointing towards when he's talking to the disciples is saying, this is real. If it weren't real, I wouldn't have told you. Now take that in, and in a spot, it actually affects the way you live. Look in Hebrews, because it goes down and it lists all this, and then it lists Jesus in his model to us. He says, let us run the race of perseverance that was marked out for us. 72 years is marked out for you. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of, our, of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. So Jesus, this is his model, this is what we're seeing here. How did Jesus love to the degree he did? How did he do the things he did? A lot of it was because he had a view of eternity. And he was able to see the unseen things and the good things that were coming. Notice this in, the, in that one verse. It says, for the joy set before him. In other words, in right now, in this spot where it's, everything's really bad, he was living for the joy set before him. It changed the way he lived in his present situation. And other verses, I think, are just a really helpful in this. When you understand eternity, it says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You know? And because this is what he's getting at. He says, believe in God and also believe in me. And then he goes in and explains the house. This is really going to happen. This eternity is really real. And then, so look in Colossians, understanding this, look how it's written. Since then we have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not earthly things. Corinthians says this, for our light, momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that is far outweighs them all. So, we fix our eyes on what is, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now, when we live in this life, it's not the temporal things aren't something that we don't have expectations on. You know, I have lots of expectations. You know, I'm expecting this, this vacation to be good. May not be. I'm expecting it. I'm I, I, expecting to have a good meal. Uh, you know, I'm expecting to have these things happen. I'm expecting all kinds of good things in a way that are temporal, the things that I don't know for sure what will happen. Right? It's not wrong with that. We, we were made for that. And it, they're beautiful things. But what happens is if we get to a place that we are trying to look for our satisfaction in our life in those things, without the eternity of the things that are coming that are good in the first place, 
it disturbs our whole life because we're living in a place where we're constantly waiting for disappointment. <laughs> and what Jesus is saying is fix your eyes on this thing that's coming. Because when you do that, you start living differently. Understand eternity. So when this 72 years, you realize this is short. I need to do what really matters in this time and what I'm made for. And so this is just really helpful right now for where we're at, right? We don't really know what's going to happen. Everybody tries to. Everybody's scrambling around. Everybody's trying to get control. We don't know what's going to happen. Could you, have figured that, could you have guessed this last year? No. What does that tell you? You may not be able to guess the next year either, right? What's going to happen if it didn't get better here? What if COVID gets worse? What if the division in our country gets worse? If it could, I, I, maybe it could, I, it just get worse, right? How could this happen? You know, what, what are we going to do? What if the economy collapses? What if killer bees come back for real? I mean, it can be anything, right? It's just like we understand in this world it's temporal and it, it doesn't always work out. We have a lot of, oh, you got to be kidding me moments. And we have beautiful moments at the same time, right? But the reality of it is, is how do we get to a place that we live in expectation now, right? Where we live in anticipation for the good that's coming. And we only can do that as we start understanding and believing who Jesus is and what he says to be true. And it starts affecting us on the inside. You know, it, it just gives us this, when we can see eternity, even glimpsing of it, and we can see the goodness of what's coming, it, we can really say, wow, this is light and momentary. Which then sounds almost crazy. Because even in the things that are happening that are hard, we know that God, with God, it actually God is doing something good in us in those process. It's this place that God always has good things coming for us, even in the middle of painful, hard things that this world brings us. And so, let's go to the invitation. You know, just view your daily choices in light of eternity. <laughs> That's like a pretty big invitation, no. But just start thinking of your daily choices, not just for those things, but thinking of eternity. It's, think of that, that little 72-year part of the cable, right? This is important. It goes quick. Make choices that are life-giving, the way you're made, the things you're made for. And then give and live in expectancy, anticipation for all that Jesus has promised is coming. And we only covered one thing. <laughs> He has lots of things. And so when we hear when Jesus says things, when we hear when God makes it very clear through Scripture, he says things, let's not have those things in our heart and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just, maybe that doesn't really, no. I said it because it's going to happen. Right? And then we get to this place in which the, we at, at this place of moving others towards Jesus. This is so crucial because if we can get a hold of this and we can have expectation and anticipation and hope right now and then we can let the joy and love that we experience now this taking what's taking place in the future and actually having it affect our present the substance of that happening now is that we as we experience life it empowers us to love with a capacity that's way beyond our ability you know because we have the joy set before us. It's always there. And it gives us the ability to love in ways we couldn't have otherwise.